So just while uh, we're getting uh, hooked up, I first of all want to thank Neil for inviting me to um, be part of the Childkind Leadership Group um, because as is known to many of you, I'm very rigid and structured and I love lists. I love any kind of lists, whether they're on my computer, my phone, my handbook. Sometimes I write them on my hand um, just because I really like to be organized. And so when he invited me to chair this committee, I think um, he was willing to put up with my over-organization. But then I realized the committee was full of these free uh, thinking, uh, doing gentlemen who I really kind of thought, how am I going to get them in order? It was, a bit like, it was a bit like herding cats. So anyways, I think we're finally sort of moving as, as a team now, and uh, I really appreciate that. And we're really trying to bring um, some order and structure to this whole uh, child kind certification uh, process. And uh, I just wanted to clarify, too, that we originally said we were accrediting, we're, we're an accreditation group, but that had a much more uh, formal feel to it. So now we call ourselves uh, a certification group. The other thing I'm going to say is that being the fourth uh, speaker this morning, you're going to hear some repetitiveness in, in what we're saying. But I've learned from teaching uh, graduate nursing and medical students that a little spillover is, is not a problem. It doesn't matter if we hear uh, the same things more than once. So can I get rid of this microphone and use this one? You, can you hear me? The handheld is for the room. The lapel is for the camera. Oh, so I need both. You, you do. And not to disrupt the flow, every time you stand away from the podium, we're getting interference. If you can stay around the podium. You want me to stay here? It's helping a lot but with the sound. But Stefan got to move everywhere. <laughs> no, <laughs> there. The, la the last thing I wanted to say um, before I start is that it feels like um, Childkind is certifying hospitals and that we are doing something for you. But in actual fact, it's a two-way process. Every hospital that we certify, we learn something from. And we keep changing our process, hopefully, to make it better. So as we're telling you what we're noticing in your setting, etc., we like to hear back um, from you as well about the process and how we could do it better. Um, so this is uh, my town, uh, Toronto, and I am a professor in the Lawrence S. Bloomberg uh, Faculty of Nursing. And this bottom slide is um, a picture of the University of Toronto. So I am officially there and uh, teach in um, actually nursing and medicine and dentistry, all three faculties. Um, but I also spend a lot of time where I do all my research um, at the Hospital for Sick Children. And you've heard a lot about this. We had some really great uh, pioneers in the, um, in the, on the clinical side of pain. And that started back, uh, Neil referred back to the 1980s. And that's when our clinical pain service was um, developed. And then in the 90s, the chronic pain service. So this institution has a great history um, for paying attention to, to pain in children. And um, just two years ago, um, our uh, philanthropist raised $400 million. And they built this beautiful uh, research tower. Uh, so that's, that's where I actually um, have my office, and, and that's what um, we're um, all about. So I think I'm showing you this picture because I think good pain management really is a collaboration, not just between people, uh, but between research and clinical practice and education. And that's what, um, that's what the places that I work uh, represent. So I really want to talk um, today, I have a, just a few objectives. We're going to real, uh, really look at child kind certification as an organizational KT strategy. So I'm going to take you into the world of implementation science, 
uh, because that's where I do my research, but I really think that's where the challenge is in uh, changing practice. We're going to review the steps to child kind certification, and Anne just did a wonderful uh, job of, of telling you exactly how to do it, but what I really want to talk about is how one size does not fit all, and there's really a lot of latitude in terms of how you uh, address these various steps. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the evaluation uh, process, how we determine as a committee uh, whether or not you receive child um, kind certification or not. And uh, also looking at the benefits of this, and Neil, Neil's touched on these already. Um, so I'll just start with a story around uh, knowledge translation. So this is not a new concept at all. Usually, uh, if we have a very <coughs> prestigious business school at the University of Toronto who thinks uh, knowledge translation really began with them and business organization. But I, so I like to tell this story when I go there. But knowledge translation really began many, many centuries ago uh, when Vasco da Gama and a crew of uh, 160 sailors uh, sailed across uh, the ocean and approximately 100 of them uh, died of scurvy and uh, it was suspected that uh, lack of uh, citrus w was maybe a problem or, or it implementing cit uh, citrus might be a cure. However, it was over uh, 100 years uh, before Captain James Lancaster sailed, and he had four ships. Um, so this was the first randomized, uh, triple controlled trial. And uh, one vessel was given three teaspoons of lemon juice daily, and they had 0% mortality uh, compared to 40% on the other uh, three ships. Um, but it took another 150 years or so uh, for a British Navy physician uh, to conduct another randomized trial. This is a cohort study. I don't think they had any control. Um, and he randomized six different treatments uh, for scorbutic sailors. And citrus, again, was uh, proving effective. Um, and then in uh, 1795, the British Navy declared citrus uh, to be part of the diet on all Navy ships. So as you can see, uh, oh, and one more step, um, the British Board of Trade adopted this innovation as the policy level uh, due to adherence from the ground up. So it took uh, 368 years from the time when they actually knew what the, the um, knew what the cure was until it was actually implemented in policy. So it's a, it's a slow process, knowledge translation. What I'm really happy to tell you is we don't have to wait 368 years now for things to change. Um, and we often say that the 368 year gap is now a 17 year gap. And when we say that, we're talking about 17 years to translate evidence from discovery into healthcare practice. Now, Neil's already told you, you saw those great pictures of the 1980s, and evidence began to emerge about solutions for pain prevention and management back in the 1980s. But you're still going to hear from speaker after speaker today that we haven't really solved the problem. If we'd solved the problem, we, we wouldn't be here today. And it always strikes me when I see this, is this is a whole child's life. The whole life of childhood uh, is captured within 17 years. So the babies that we see now are still suffering from the effects of uh, poor pain prevention and management uh, today. Um, and we also know another really disturbing fact is that only about 14% of good evidence is believed to enter day-to-day -day clinical practice. So it's not just that it takes a long time to get there, but we also know that it takes, um, that a lot of it never, never gets, gets into practice. So this 17-year estimate, I'm a researcher, and when I think of the time from when we think of the original research idea 
and we submit it for funding and it gets accepted hopefully for funding we do the trial then we do a publication and then those publications get synthesized into guideline, guidelines or a database, etc. And then it gets synthesized into book chapters, etc. And then it finally gets taken up for practice. That all takes a long, long time. So sometimes this is uh, known as the no-do gaps. And we know that there's persistent gaps between what we know and what we do. And sometimes people use uh, Groovy as uh, as Stefan would say, acronym like the K2A gaps, and they give rise to practice variation. <laughs> and that practice variation affects patient outcomes, quality outcomes, safety outcomes, efficiency, and cost. And you see that there's, there's a really um, a scale, a sliding scale, with patients who are our target audience at one end to systems and societies, which are the outcomes at another end. And that's what makes some of these implementation of new knowledge uh, difficult, because we have many, many target uh, audiences and target outcomes. The bottom line, though, is that creating, distilling, and spreading of knowledge is necessary, but not sufficient to close these, nap, these gaps. So evidence alone, knowledge alone, is not going to do it. What we really need is to think about bridging uh, the gap with knowledge and innovation. And I can't help but stress how important innovation is. We need to do, as Stefan said, something that is easier than uh, what's being done currently. And it really helps if it's innovative, too. People love innovation. They don't want to just hear about another new guideline that we've created. So this whole science of implementation science has been born in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. And you hear about it. There's all kinds of terminology for it. Implementation science, knowledge translation, knowledge transfer, knowledge exchange. Um, there's all kinds of names for it. But in the end, what we're really trying to do is get new evidence or new knowledge into a form that somebody can use it. It might be a practitioner, it might be an educator, it might be a researcher. Now, Stefan asked you uh, why we don't do this, and you came up with half a dozen reasons or so, but I always uh, like to try and outdo them, and it's pretty hard. Um, so we know that there's many reasons why we don't do KT. So there's 50 reasons that people give us uh, not to change. And some of the ones that he um, didn't really talk about is, you know, it's not my job. Um, I, I'm not responsible for doing that. Um, I don't have the authority do, to do it. It's not in my scope of practice. Uh, we don't have optimum conditions to do about. It's the weekend. We only do that from Monday to Friday. So all of these things are reasons why, why we don't change, why, why we don't do KT. And I always give the example. I say, if you think of the person that you care about most in the world, if it's your uh, husband, if it's your uh, partner, if it's your child, if it's your best friend, and there's something about them that you don't like, that you want them to change, just think how hard it is to do that. And then we move to the people that you work with every day, and you like them, but they're not the most important person in your life, and if they're not doing good pain assessment, think how hard it is to get them to change, and then take it to uh, another level of, oh, do you, want, do you want to get these? <laughs> another level of, uh, another degree, degree of separation. And, and then you think, how hard is it to get people that I don't know within my institution to change? So this whole idea of behavioral change. Oh, on Twitter now. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, you're a little distracting, <laughs> but go for it, it's okay. 
So, so I'm interested in the underlying mechanisms of all of this. So there are many uh, frameworks, theories, and models which try to provide some guidance for us for implementation science. And this is one I like. I like the acronym. It's called the Paris model. And it's really the interface of three main constructs. Uh, one is evidence, and under evidence, we don't just think about research evidence. There's a uh, local evidence. So think about those individuals that have worked on a unit for the past 20 years. Because I'm a nurse, I, and I graduated a long time ago. I know lots of nurses, for example, that have worked in the neonatal unit or the emergency unit their whole life, and they know through seeing so many similar kinds of patients and situations, they figured out um, which way works best. And that's valuable evidence, although we often don't uh, accredit much credence to it. We also uh, develop guidelines from evidence, and if they're up to date and current, um, then they could be a form of evidence. Uh, systematic reviews, another form of evidence. But we know that evidence isn't enough. We know that we have to have a way to facilitate the translation of that evidence uh, into something that's useful for the user. And we often call that facilitation. And these are our knowledge translation strategies. And you've seen some of them this morning. The posters, the buttons, the uh, screensavers. And one of my favorite in one of our studies was uh, the, the unit staff got black t-shirts with fluorescent uh, signs that said, remember to assess your patient's pain at night. And these were glow-in-the-dark t-shirts that had flashing lights on them that they used to wear in the night. They're, they're just a reminder to do this. And then we have all kinds of education, quality improvement, audit and feedback. Those are all knowledge translation strategies, but they're not enough either. You know from experience that educating people doesn't do it. So evidence not enough alone, facilitation not enough alone. The big black box in implementation science is context. And context can refer to an individual child and family. It can refer to a hospital unit. It can refer to a hospital. It can refer to a whole healthcare system or society. And one of the most difficult challenges within context is culture. And the vernacular for culture is the way we do things around here. And you know if you go as a new nurse or resident or physiotherapist or psychologist to a new setting, you run right up against that. And you see it in the body language, you see it in the communication. Sometimes it's much more um, much more uh, evident than that. In nursing, we call it eating your young. And all your nice nursing students go and they're so enthusiastic and they're going to address this problem about pain and they run into one of those 20-year-old nurses who works at night and they say, we don't do that around here. And, and that's very, very difficult to overcome. But basically, if we can get good evidence uh, an effective facilitation strategy into a receptive <coughs> culture, we will be able to change outcomes. Process outcomes, which I think of as doing better pain assessment and management, and clinical outcomes, which, which is basically we want the kids to have less pain or no pain, ideally. So this is articulated within this framework, and, and there's many more like it. And so when you look at that framework about implementation science, and then you look at the child kind model, you can see that they're basically incorporating the same principles and concepts. That in order to have practice change, we need to use uh, good sources of evidence, we need to use uh, effective KT uh, strategies, and as well, we have to pay a lot of attention to uh, culture. So I don't have to tell you this, that um, we keep saying that pain management is inadequate uh, in most of the world. And this is for a lot of reasons. Part of the reason is uh, access, 
Um, there's a failure to recognize the, the uh, downside of pain, especially uh, chronic pain, and that it's a chronic health problem. There's major deficits in uh, knowledge of healthcare professionals, and most countries have no national policy or very inadequate policies of uh, pain management. I'm doing uh, quite a lot of work in uh, Ghana to help develop nursing curricula there, and um, I've been there for four years, and we still have very little in terms of uh, pain assessment or, or management policies or even attention to pain uh, as a problem. So we have an ethical imperative for knowledge translation. We're slow to implement new knowledge and to reliably deliver treatments of known effectiveness. Adults only receive about 50% of the recommended acute, chronic, or preventative health care, and half of critically injured patients do not receive uh, recommended care, and children only receive less than half. So this is my granddaughter Charlotte, and when she went to have her first immunizations, I insisted on going with her, and I had a whole uh, doctor's bag full of strategies with me, all the distraction, the local numbing cream, um, the sucrose, and I brought a filming crew with me because I really wanted to nail what was going to happen. Well, she had, she had everything. And then she, of course, screeched when they put the two intramuscular injections in. But my daughter, who was wonderful and breastfeeding her, said, Mom, she only cried for five seconds. And if you hadn't done all this, it would have been at least five minutes. And by the way, you're not coming back for the next immunization. <laughs> so I, I had my one, one shot. So there are knowledge uh, gaps. And I'm just going to put you to work for a, a minute because I know I stand between you and lunch, which is always a really bad uh, place to speak in the agenda. So I just want you to turn to your neighbor and I want you to talk about a knowledge gap and how that might affect a patient outcome, uh, more of an institutional outcome such as quality or safety, and efficiency or cost. So just turn, you're all in nice little groups of two or three, just turn to your neighbors. I'm gonna give you two to three minutes and then we're gonna talk about the impact of these uh, knowledge gaps on uh, outcomes. So I'm gonna ask you to stop now. This, this was just the icebreaker and I, I'm gonna urge you to go back and uh, chat further with the individual that you were talking about but just uh, maybe could one or two people give me an example of the knowledge to action gap that they talked about and what kind of impact it had anybody willing to share one you were all talking there must have been something yes So we were discussing the use of EMLA and um, a lot of feelings related to it about vasoconstriction and it not being used frequently even though it's ordered on every patient that's admitted in our institution. Um, and the culture to, to do that, but really the knowledge to go along with that and what does it really cause, um, what effects does that have, what outcomes can it lead to um, in hopes to try to so I think that's an example of how we focus a lot on what I call individual uh, contextual factors. So we're focusing on the uh, factors that actually uh, we think we can address by addre educating the individual, for example. So we're focusing on the healthcare professional, their knowledge, their attitudes towards things. And I think that's one level of change that we need to focus on. But the much harder one, of course, is the institutional level. And often that goes not beyond culture that we've talked about, 
but it goes into things like the support of the leadership, the uh, communication patterns, both formal and informal, uh, between healthcare professionals and healthcare professionals and families, resources, space, uh, what people do with slack time, all of those things uh, are part of context and what we need to think about. So with that introduction, I wanted to see how we can apply the science of implementation uh, to the criteria for child kind. Now we've talked about these already, um, so I don't think we need to spend uh, too much time. They seem fairly simple, and you'd think fairly simple to address. I think everybody understands what, what they are. Um, but what I really want to show you is I want to link these uh, criterion uh, with the child kind certification process. So we don't just, you don't just go to the website and look up child kind and decide, okay, I'm going to do an application and submit it. What we've really tried to do is we've tried to develop a process whereby um, we can not only have a standardized approach to certification, but so we can walk you through the process and hopefully the steps so to guarantee that you will be successful. So the first um, three steps are really around notification of interest. And um, I'm going to use Anne's example that she talked about because she said that they first really got interested in child kind. I believe it was in 2011. And it wasn't until 2015 that they actually submitted the application. But we really want to know of, of your interest because we want to be able to guide you along this process as much as we can. And we do have a committee uh, with uh, six people on it right now. And we would like to um, assign one of them to actually be your key contact so that you have one person that's going to walk you through this whole certification process. As well, when you first let us know that you're interested in child kind application, Carrie will go through with you who the contact people are, how do we get a hold of you, what's your email address, all of those kinds of things. So the first thing is that notification of interest. Then we assign one of the members of the child kind as a key contact. And um, they're going to work with you hopefully throughout the whole uh, process. And then a really important piece that we didn't do in the beginning, to be quite honest, um, that we have really talked about is this pre-application interview. And we try to set that up uh, with the child kind key contact as well as the individuals from your setting that are going to lead the way. They're going to take responsibility for this. And the objective is really to elicit where you are in terms of the child crime criteria. So some institutions may have everything in place and, and really are ready to go. Others may be partially there, and some others maybe not at all. Um, but this pre-application interview really gives us at child kind an opportunity to help pinpoint uh, where you are and what are the next steps in terms of you. I, if I was the key contact person, I would do the interview, I would summarize it, I would take it back uh, to our certification uh, committee, and we would come up with a recommendation. Either proceed with the application, uh, delay maybe until some of the criteria that are addressed. So for example, if there was no um, pain policy at your institution, we would probably say, you need to go back and really work on this, before you come forward for child kind application. And there might be some um, that are delayed indefinitely. So I've done some pre-application interviews where people say, we're really interested in this, but uh, we're just uh, replacing the chair of uh, the anesthesia department and we have a nurse practitioner coming next year um, that's going to work on this. So this is not 
a, a good time for them. So they're going to put this on hold indefinitely. However, uh, if proceeding, uh, we then really try and go for that first uh, criteria, uh, which is the institutional support. And we invite the letter uh, from uh, the CEO um, or somebody that's in senior management that is not just going to say we're supportive of addressing pain in children, but is going to outline key initiatives that really indicate um, that, that support. And then we proceed along the lines of um, inviting preparation and set a date for submission of the application. And sometimes people are vague about that. They say we're going to do this within the next six months. Some people tell me they're going to do it within the next month. But I mean, it's the ball is in your court then. You can go ahead and prepare this. Once we get the uh, application, we distribute it to the Child Kind uh, Certification Committee. Uh, everybody reviews it. Then we meet as many times as we need um, to discuss that uh, application. Uh, usually that then proceeds uh, for the recommendation for the site visit, although sometimes we go back and ask for more information, more clarity on pieces of it, or we might say we'd really like to go to the NICU when we come to your site and really see how you manage procedural pain in babies. So sometimes it will come with uh, those um, kinds of recommendations. And then we set the date for the site visit, and usually a team of three to four site visitors come. We usually have somebody from medicine, somebody from psychology, somebody from nursing, and we might have a, a, a duplicate of that or a, another uh, person. Um, at the site visit, this is a really important time uh, for the site to be uh, back and forth with your key contact person because now we've come to learn and this is over time that there are certain things that we really like to um, ask you to highlight when when we're at the site and we've learned this I remember the very uh, first site visit we did at Boston Children's Hospital we basically just asked them to go ahead and show us whatever it was they wanted to show us to the most recent one that we're planning, where we've asked a lot of, of specifics. Um, we asked the site to address key areas from the application, um, and we also like to have a variety of activities, some presentations, but we also like to go on to the units, and I think as Anne said, um, sometimes we just see a patient and a mother in a room and we'd like to go in and, and talk to them and of course ask permission to do that. At the end of the day we like to meet with the team and give them some idea of what our first impressions are, although we won't grant certification at that time. But we like to say these are the things we really liked, what we saw, these seem to be the things that are our uh, limitations. Then we go away and we prepare a formal report of the site visit and uh, with input from all of the site visitors. And then we uh, notify you. And you saw that nice uh, uh, plaque that, that was given. So that is more or less the, uh, the process that the certification uh, committee goes through. Um, you know that um, I'm just going to give you some examples of each one of these criteria taking the process. So we're looking, when we're looking for institutional commitment, we're looking for support from leadership. <coughs> Usually people uh, have a, a well-established uh, pain policy and there's some sort of uh, pain committee. We're interested in accountability. So that uh, question that came up earlier about what do you do if you know, people don't really buy into this if they don't really follow the pain policy. So we're looking at is there, um, you know, can a parent uh, phone and make a, a complaint if, if their pain, child's pain isn't being uh, looked after? What do you do with staff who, who don't uh, follow pain policies? Is there something in the staff evaluation um, that relates to pain? 
What about the accessibility of pain services? And this, is, this comes up in chronic pain, especially where there may be a wait time uh, of quite a while. And, and how do you account for that? Is there a process in place where somebody can evaluate um, that child and see if for some reason they, they need more urgent services? And then the whole issue of patient, parent, and uh, staff engagement. So all of these kinds of things really fall under the institutional commitment. In terms of education, this is uh, one of the, the pain uh, management strategies that we are all familiar with. Uh, but we're looking for details about how education and awareness of pain is really addressed both for new staff, most orientation programs now include something about pain, but not, we don't want to just know about nurses. We want to know about uh, physicians, physiotherapies, and what about the non-professional staff? Do they know anything about pain? What about ongoing education for continuing staff? What about those nurses that have worked there for 20 years, and you've seen how the the playing field for the evidence of pain has changed. If they were only <coughs> educated 20 years ago, what are they doing now? Um, are there developmentally and culturally sensitive education for patients and families? So does this re re really relate to um, the full spectrum of children, uh, including infants right up to adolescents? And what about all of um, the uh, families that come from different cultures? I know at the hospital that I work, we have translation services for over 70 different uh, languages. And their perceptions of pain are very different. So it's not just a language issue. So it's that uh, cultural sensitivity. And then the awareness of clinical and non-clinical staff regarding pain. So there's a lot um, to the education that we're looking for. In terms of pain assessment, um, we're hoping there's a pain assessment policy at the hospital. And we're looking, we now know that there are, there are you know, dozens and even hundreds of standardized, validated, uh, age-appropriate pain assessment tools. So we're looking to see which ones your institution is using. Uh, we also look at clinically important pain assessment levels. So right now in our institution, for example, we used to say, you know, we were, were going up the uh, ramp in terms of the percentage of children that have pain assessed, and we reach 90 and then 95 and almost 100% <coughs> in most of the units. But now we're really interested not only in whether pain is assessed, but what are the proportion of children that have moderate to severe pain? And you can understand that that's much more difficult to get at. We have somewhere between 20 and 25% of children on any given day that are still rating their pain as moderate to severe. So we're not only looking to get that down, but trying to drill down and see who those kids are and what we can do about it. And then we're looking at things like if, a, if, a, if we're promoting family-centered care and parents are there, what can they do to be good advocates uh, for their children in terms of pain assessment results? In terms of pain management, we're really looking for a multifaceted and integrated approach to pain management. We're looking for written protocols for procedural, post-operative, persistent, and even um, disease-specific pain treatment. So for example, uh, some hospitals send us their policies around sickle cell pain or uh, acute crises during, uh, in sickle cell patients. We're looking for that multidimensional pain management, looking at all different kinds of pharmacological, psychological, physical, and behavioral management. Pain prevention at our own institution, this is something I think we were so focused on decreasing pain and then moderate to severe pain, we sort of completely forgot about pain prevention. So we're, we're now starting to really look at that. And of course, we know when it comes to procedural pain, if you can decrease the number of heel lances or blood draws a child has, that's an excellent pain prevention strategy. 
And then we're looking at the roles of various healthcare professionals across pain treatment. In terms of quality improvement, we're really now looking for evidence of how pain is being moderated and evaluated, and some sort of documentation of the QI activities. We know that um, pain management may or may not be evident in uh, individuals' evaluation, and even in job descriptions, is there anything in there that would indicate that pain is a priority in your institution? Where uh, I think it was uh, Stefan that looked at the uh, satisfaction scores, the uh, picker scores versus the actual uh, pro pain processes that were improving in the ho hospitals. And I know these are important institutional outcomes. And then evidence of the evaluation of uh, quality uh, um, improvement initiatives. So we need to actually evaluate the QI initiatives themselves. So I think the, um, the take home message here is that these are all examples of the kinds of evidence that you can provide to actually uh, indicate to us that you are meeting these five criteria. We don't want to be so prescriptive that we say this is exactly what you have to do. Some of those things, like having a pain policy, for example, is probably really fundamental to being successful in your application. But many of these other things, you have a choice. And we really like to see the breadth and, and depth of, of what you do have. Uh, we're trying to look at the best way for you to present that data to us. We've had long applications, hundreds and hundreds of pages and we've had short applications with hardly any pages. So we're trying to meet a happy medium, thinking of around 100 pages or so, where you can provide us with links so we can link to your pain assessment policy. And we go in and look anyways. We look you up and, and see what you've got on your, on your website that around pain and specialty pain teams, et cetera. So I just want to say that this isn't as prescriptive as it may sound, there is a lot of latitude. We're just looking to see how well you can substantiate each of those principles. So um, I think you saw this exact uh, slide uh, with, uh, with Neil, but again, uh, child kind certification <coughs> is we're trying to have a, a structured, uh, consistent, standardized uh, process to evaluate uh, current pain practices, pain assessment, pain management, pain prevention. Uh, it gives us an opportunity and you an opportunity to benchmark what you're doing uh, against other similar institutions. And this, um, this is articulated well through the resources as well. You can go in and look at all of those uh, policies, etc. cetera. Um, it provides technical assistance to improve the quality of care and uh, we want to uh, actually create this community of practice where people uh, from child kind uh, certified institutions will be able to meet together in one way or another to really uh, share uh, their successes, challenges, and values. Um, so we have made enormous progress. You've heard uh, there's been lots of uh, stops and starts, if you will to the effectiveness of pain research. Um, but there's been lots of progress made. However, um, there's still lots of gaps, lots of knowledge to action uh, gaps. And there's also implementation gaps. Sometimes even though we have excellent uh, evidence, we don't implement it. Um, and so we really have to turn to the KT strategies, such as education, the use of guidelines, um, all kinds of other things, reminders, quality improvement, uh, audits, and if we uh, implement them effectively, the chances are we will be much more uh, successful than just trying to use evidence alone. And uh, organizational KT strategies such as child kind have the potential to really change outcomes at uh, all kinds of, of levels. 
So we want to make sure that you are uh, successful in the child kind uh, certification uh, process. And I think you really need to look carefully at how your organization uh, is able to demonstrate um, these five principles. It's kind of like uh, the bundle in the uh, children's comfort promise. You can't just be good at a couple of them. You need to actually be good at, at all uh, five of them. And I think that it starts with the strong leadership and the uh, organizational commitment that pain is a priority. Uh, you need champions to lead the certification initiative. And usually a team uh, works really well, and a team that represents different pro uh, professions, different uh, factions, different types of pain, uh, usually somewhere between three and five people uh, work well. You need somebody that's going to do all the work, because it is, is a lot of work. Um, have, looking at your institutional pain processes and practices, if you haven't updated your pain assessment policy for six years or eight years, I would suggest that you do that kind of thing before you come uh, forward to um, child kind certification. Uh, engagement of multiple stakeholders. When we come for the visit, we want to talk to nurses on the floor, technicians, the physiotherapist, the resident, the family, the child, the administrator. So you need to have lots of buy-in. People need to know uh, what's happening. And when they sort of look at us with a blank stare, um, that's not a good indication that they really have, have got uh, institutional buy-in. So I think engaging multiple stakeholders, uh, monitoring and evaluation of quality improvement. If you're doing audits all the time, we see these, these nice graphs, but I always say I want to, what do you think is going to happen when that graph ends? Are you going to sustain your success and what have you put into place to do that? And then uh, lots of patience and flexibility. So I think I'm uh, going to stop there. I know that uh, we're going to have time uh, this afternoon to talk about it, but does anybody have any um, urgent questions that they want to ask? Yes, Carl. I think this isn't urgent for me or my institution, but it, it might be of interest to some of the folks here. Um, think of a hypothetical application and uh, in the site visit you find out that there's an area let's say I don't know a surgical uh, ward or a particular service where in, in the context of excellent pain care management policy education and everything else in everywhere else you've got this gap this this gap that everybody says oh don't, don't go there well in our case we have a place called the screamer clinic and I'm not kidding uh, maybe it is relevant to, to where we are uh, and um, what would the, how would the accreditation or the certification process handle that? Pointing it out may alienate that body further. Thanks, Carl. That's a good question. So that's why um, when we come to do the site visit, we don't make a determination right then and there about whether we're going to certify this hospital. We actually like to try and bring all the information back and really mull it over and think about, you know, within the full context of the five criteria, does this one outstanding issue really preclude us awarding certification or is it something that we can really um, point out as an issue that either would need to be addressed before we provide uh, certification, or is it something that uh, with our child kind letter we might be able to help the institution? So we've often had that conversation with the, the uh, group that we're going to the hospital to uh, certify, certify. Is there anything that we can say in our letter going back to the, the CEO that would be helpful to you in advancing uh, better pain practices? So again, it's this two-way street, and I think um, 
you know, to provide an answer to your question, we would, we would really have to come back and, and think about that. And we haven't automatically uh, provided child kind certification to every institution. In some cases, we've come back and said, based on your application, based on the site visit, we still think you need to address some of these. And then we might uh, arrange to uh, get back to them you know, a, a time period down the line. Is, is that fair, Neil, or would you say anything else? Again, I'd like to just reiterate uh, Stefan's point about the good being the enemy of the perfect. And uh, our goal is to improve the quality of what people do, give them advice, one, uh, unless it's a major flaw that they that we uncover. I, I think for the most part, we're willing to sort of make recommendations and help people do a better job with what they're doing based on our experience, recognizing that in all of our institutions, nothing is working. And we certainly could find somebody who's doing a horrible job. and. Uh, that we stumble upon as we're walking uh, through the halls, and uh, that wouldn't preclude an institution that's made a genuine effort to do a better job. At least that's how I Yes? Um, what's the continuing process after certification? What's the continuing process? Yeah. So I think that's a really good question, and uh, we've, we've been asked that, like when do we need to recertify, et cetera. And uh, quite frankly, we have not really addressed that very fully yet. I think it's uh, one of the things we're, we're still in our infancy and we're trying to uh, perfect this certification process. But I think um, the recertification, I mean, we, we need to address that. I think there was an earlier question about certifying uh, units within larger hospitals as you know, pediatric childcare units. That again is something we're just beginning to encounter. We want to move beyond North America and so we think when we get to uh, low and middle income and developing countries, again, it will be a different process. So we're growing. It's kind of like we're just one step ahead of the uh, institutions that are actually applying for certification. So it's kind of like stay tuned. We're going to figure that out shortly and then we'll let you know. Linda mentioned something that's quite interesting. We are trying to develop a kind of a user group of, of all of us to develop a sort of community electronically <laughs> and to sort of share information and see where we're going. And we hope that that will keep all of us sort of going. Uh, that doesn't address the recertification issue, but it, it will keep, keep in contact with each other so we can know on our own how to continue to improve. But uh, right now we don't have any plans for another process and whatever. We're a bit overwhelmed with what we're present in the time. 